Hello? Maurice? Hi, everyone. Uh, Maurice is out this morning. I am covering from, this is Joe Sarabi from City Planning, and I'll be managing the WebEx. So just let me know when you uh, want to get started. We are streaming to the public on YouTube and recording. Okay, I'm ready. Is, is Freddie here? Hi, Mr. Chair. This is Anthony Santora. Freddie will not be able to join us today. So I'm Sorry, I walked out of my office and I, I missed the beginning. <laughs> so, Anthony, you want to start off? Yes, Anthony, whenever you're ready. Go ahead. So, good morning. In compliance with notification requirements of Ohio's open meeting law under COVID-19 emergency declaration, notice of this meeting has been publicly posted. All boards and commissions under the purview of the city planning department conducts its meetings according to Robert's rules of order. Actions during the meeting will be taken by voice vote. Abstentions from any vote due to a conflict of interest should be stated for the record prior to the taking of any vote. In order to ensure that everyone participating in the meeting have the opportunity to be heard, we ask that you use the raised hand feature before asking a question or making a comment. The raised hand feature can be found in the participants panel on the desktop and mobile version and activated by clicking the hand icon. Please wait for the chair or facilitator to recognize you and be sure to select unmute and announce yourself before you speak. When finished speaking, please lower your hand by clicking on the raised hand icon again and mute your microphone. We will also be utilizing the chat feature to communicate with participants. The chat feature can be activated by clicking the chat button located on the bottom of the WebEx screen. Call in users to unmute by using star six. All meeting activity is being recorded via the WebEx platform. These proceedings are also being live streamed via YouTube. We have provided a link to the meeting for those who wish to speak on a particular case via our website and email. We have also received emails from those who have provided written comments on a particular matter. And with that, Mr. Chair, I can turn the meeting over. Great. Uh, Michael, call the roll, please. Bowen. Present. Downing. Present. Fluker. Curry. Present. Paul. Slife. Present. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, so the first one is a special presentation uh, of public art, which is at uh, 9808 Cedar Road uh, or Cedar Avenue. Tara, Tara, are you here for this? I am here. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Commission. Um, I'm Tara Petras, public art coordinator for the city of Cleveland. The first project that's coming before you today is a um, second uh, a portion of the Brooks Bio Repository. Today, you're going to be looking at the public art and surrounding landscaping. This project was approved unanimously at the East Design Review District on May 25th. Um, and I have to say that uh, I really commend uh, David Burlakamp, the architects, and uh, the hospital system um, for heavily engaging the Fairfax community where this public art will reside. Um, I'm very much in support of the art. It's something very different um, than we've seen throughout the city with regard to public art installations. And again, they did heavily engage the community. The community will have a large voice uh, in what this is going to be. Um, it was approved with the conditions to extend the center walkway to Cedar uh, Cleveland Clinic will actually determine the size of materials for that. They were also told to widen the gravel strip north of uh, the uh, the bench and west to include the frontage for the bench so it's more welcoming to pedestrians and um, consider a change of trees. With that said, I want to turn it over to the presenter, David Burlakamp. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, David. Good morning. Um, I also have with me Ellen Rudolph, uh, who, to give her proper credit, she l largely headed up a lot of the community um, interfacing and, and development of the artwork herself. So um, she'll be able to speak to some of the artwork itself um, and, and some of the context with that. Uh, as Tara mentioned, we're looking to bring this forward for final approval. Um, the, the project, and actually we, we can ad advance the, the next slide. Um, 
so the, the project is located at the corner of 97th and Cedar. Um, as Sarah mentioned, it is part of the bio repository site. So this is located on the west side of the site. Uh, the bio repository is um, wrapping up construction uh, as we speak now. Um, and what, what we're really looking to do is bring this, uh, or what, what this really was, was a community artwork piece that was designed with the artists um, in conjunction with uh, community members of the community. And we've also, as, as Tara mentioned, um, provided some um, additional landscaping around the area to just enhance the site itself. Um, so I'll turn it over to Ellen to kind of introduce the artwork itself and speak to that a little bit more. Good morning. Um, the uh, artwork is basically a uh, video created by the uh, New York-based artist Jacoby Satterwhite. He is a multimedia artist who proposed to do uh, to create a video that will be embedded in uh, a, a masonry wall that will be clad in uh, wallpaper that Jacoby himself designs. Uh, and the concept uh, for the video itself is um, that Jacoby will be utilizing um, images submitted by members of the Fairfax community that represent their idea of um, sort of hope and a positive future. So he kind of asked, um, he, he posed the question, what is your blueprint for utopia? Uh, what brings you hope and peace and solace? And we worked with a uh, community facilitator who went out into the um, Fairfax neighborhood, met face-to-face uh, -face with residents and talked to them a little bit about the, um, the purpose of the biorepository and invited them to, um, to provide, to, to create uh, a drawing that Jacoby could then incorporate into his um, into his video. So he makes 3D uh, animated videos. He will be kind of translating them into his uh, visual language. And then um, the, the video itself will incorporate um, many of these images submitted by Fairfax neighborhood residents. So just a little bit of context, we provided some of the previous submissions for the bio repository um, and we can kind of just slowly cycle through these um, next slides here showing where this sits on, on the site. Um, so this is again on the west side of the site where there's a large landscape area. Um, again, just a couple background slides for reference. Uh, so this begins to show a little bit of the location and layout of the artwork itself and landscape. Um, we, we oriented the artwork in a north south orientation. Um, we felt that it gave a little bit more transparency through the site, both through, through, through the site to the community and to Cedar Avenue. Um, we were trying to avoid any sense of barriers or um, obstructions along Cedar Avenue. So, some details of the wall itself. Um, as, as Ellen mentioned, we, we really needed this to be just a robust wall system that we could attach the artwork to itself. So um, we we designed a masonry wall that would have the the video screen embedded in that recessed in that. Um, so that would be clad in a um, vinyl the, the artwork would be a vinyl um, skin that would be applied to that. Um, and one question that was raised during our design review was um, the maintenance of that. So we do anticipate having to um, maintain that skin as it that that vinyl as it may age over time and make color may fade. Um, the the maintenance and replacement of that would be um, considered and factored in from from an ongoing artwork standpoint. Um, again, this shows a little bit more of a rendered site plan showing some of the benches, um, some 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 of the landscape features. Um, one of the things that was brought up, as Tara mentioned at the beginning, was um, making some connection from Cedar as well. So we did want to, we, we we likely will take the leftmost sidewalk and have that um, replace that over on the center sidewalk to make more of a, a connection through the center of the site. So residents can access this either coming from the south, from the neighborhood, or coming from uh, Cedar. Next slide. So the next um, several slides are just some 3D views, 3D perspective views of the site, um, the the general location of the artwork, and just to note that this is just a placeholder p 
piece of artwork that Jacoby had done previously. So um, this wouldn't necessarily be the specific artwork design that would be applied, but something of this um, of, of this style. And if we continue cycling through, um, so this of course is at 97th along 97th Street looking east. Um, as we continue through, you'll see that the screen is located on the east side of this wall. We felt that it gave a little bit of both protection just from logistical protection from any vandals or um, any, any kind of vandalism or um, um, damage from, from more of the street side. So the if we go to the next slide, I think you can start to see so where that screen would be with um, some seating facing that, uh, we felt that it kind of gave a little bit more of a enclosed space, not, not enclosed space, but a space separate from the, the street itself. Um, so allowing uh, residents uh, opportunity to kind of detach from the streetscape and um, view the artwork itself. And we have some, some background information just on the artist himself, as well as I think the next slide also has some um, of his work, previous work, and some community responses that we've had. So, I, Ellen, I don't know if there was anything that you wanted to um, kind of add with them, any of these slides here. Uh, yeah, just to mention that we we held a couple of virtual workshops uh, last winter, um, including many uh, Cleveland Clinic and uh, community stakeholders uh, to explain the purpose of the biorepository. And, and Jacoby talked about his um, vision for this project, and we. Um, we had really extremely positive response. Um, we're, we're very excited about this project, and um, and and uh, just a note to mention that Jacoby um, suffered from uh, childhood cancer and spent quite a lot of time um, in hospitals when he was younger, and um, and so feels very um, drawn to this project because of the context of Cleveland Clinic and the biorepository. Commission members? Move approval, Downing. I'll second. Motion second. Further discussion? Michael, call the roll, please. Bowen? Yes. Downing? Yes. Curry? Yes. Slide? Yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Tara, the next one is on Lorraine Avenue Public Art. Yes, the, uh, the next is a uh, series of public art installations in uh, Ward 16, various locations along Lorraine Avenue. Um, this is actually phase three of a project that uh, Bel Air Puritus Development Corporation has been um, working on since 2015 to um, as part of their pedestrian friendly plan with city architecture. Um, so uh, there's going to be multiple components just to beautify the area. And I am going to um, actually, I'm in support of this as well. And I'm going to turn it over to, um, uh, I'm sorry, Melissa Miller from Bel Air Puritus to go over the, the particulars. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as Tara said, that this is our phase three of the Lorraine Avenue public art plan, which started after, um, which started and grew out of our TLCI Lorraine Avenue pedestrian friendly plan. Um, the first two phases in, uh, included lighting and um, two different stone pieces from the former John Marshall High School. This phase include some benches from John Marshall High School, some signage around Jefferson Park, and then what we bring are bringing you today are um, wrap, we're wrapping several different structures in the public right of way with original art pieces done by local artists. We are doing seven bus shelters, six planter boxes, four large traffic signaling boxes, and seven small pull boxes. And the Current slide shows you where everything is located on the street. If you want to, you can move to the next slide. So these are the um, the seven bus shelters. The seven the seven bus shelters will all have the same design. The artist that have, we have been that we had chose to do the bus shelters is April Blinkney. So if you want to move a few more, April has. Um, these are the actual bus shelters. April has extensive um, 
public art experience. She has done work for RTA before. This is a building. This is, will be on all of the bus shelters. This is a building um, on 128th and Lorraine. That is a house from the neighborhood and she has incorporated other aspects of the Lorraine uh, area in Ward 16 in her design. So the next thing that we are doing are the six planter boxes. Bel Air Puritus got six planter boxes after the RNC and we placed them um, in around 135th and Lorraine in those areas. And we will be covering those planter boxes. We will be doing two different designs. On those planter boxes, the first design was done by Alicia Vasquez, so you can you can move on to the design pieces. These are the planter boxes that we still have. So Alicia Vasquez will be getting um, will be doing three in her design, and we'll be doing three in Susie Underwood. Susie Underwood um, is one of the artists that is not only local to Cleveland; she's local to the Bel Air Puritus community. So those are the two pieces that we are um, installing on the planter boxes. You can move forward to the next slide. The next slide shows where the seven small boxes are on the poles, as well as the four larger traffic signaling boxes that we intend to wrap with artwork. The large traffic signaling boxes are each getting their own design. Um, there will be two of those designs will be done with, by two artists called that call work together as don't panic. And then the two other pieces, um, the two other traffic signaling boxes will be done by Giorgio Sabino and Hector Vega. So if you can move forward, these are the four large traffic signaling boxes that go from 130th to 143rd along Lorraine Avenue. And the the don't panic boxes um, are both going to have that kind of graffiti background with um, two different birds that that um, are we find in the Bel Air Puritus neighborhood. Bel Air Puritus has the Puritus wetlands, which is an 88 acre detention basin um, that we did a study with the Natural History Museum. is home to over 140 different um, avian species through their migration patterns. And so we are going to be doing two of the birds that tend to migrate and hang out for a little bit in the Bel Air Puritus neighborhood will be on those plant on those traffic signaling boxes. And then Giorgio and Hector have um, incorporated images of Cleveland along with images of buildings from and from the neighborhood that are going to be going into their designs. So if you can move to the next one, then we have these small pole boxes that are often tagged with graffiti and just, um, so we wanted to do something with them. They will all be getting one design. Charlie Francis is the artist that is going to be doing um, the design for these pole boxes. Charlie is also a Bel Air Puritus resident um, and an and a artist who has a lot of public art experience. She's going to be doing this, this wallpaper type design, and this is the color palette that she'll be using um, on that. I think somehow you muted yourself. I think it's okay. I'm going to move approval because I don't know that we need to see every box, but um, we've seen a lot of these, so I move approval. And I'll awesome. second. We have a motion and second. Further discussion? Hearing none, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Abstain. Curry. Yes. Pomp, I'm sorry. Slide. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Good luck. The next one is on 2630 Payne Avenue. Yes, this mural is uh, a collaboration um, with uh, the artist Wordsmith, um, who's internationally renowned, but he's actually um, from Cleveland. 
it is part of a larger series. I believe you all have seen at least one of his murals come before you already. It's part of a series called How Do I Love Thee Tour of Cleveland, where he's um, uh, putting murals in different neighborhoods um, on the I Love you, How Do I Love Thee Tour. Uh, Rachel Pollock is here representing Graffiti Heart. Um, it's another project that I support. I think um, this style is very different than other murals. Um, Wordsmith style is more um, leaning towards a, a vintage typography, um, using words and phrases to engage the viewer. And I, uh, this was approved by the Euclid Corridor Design Review yesterday, um, and that was with no conditions. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rachel, and then I believe Joyce Wong is here from Midtown, who's also uh, collaborating on this as well. Thank you. Hi guys, um, I'm Rachel Pollock, and I uh, serve with uh, Stami on Graffiti Hearts Board, and um, we're just uh, seeking approval for uh, one of these Wordsmith murals today. Um, you can go to the next slide, and actually, so as um, Tara said. We're, we're working with Wordsmith. He's originally from Cleveland. He's now based in London, um, but he's received lots of acclaim all over the world um, for some of his murals using his insignia typewriter. Um, next slide. Um, he went to the University of Miami. I know that some of you have already seen some of this, so I'm, so I'm gonna try to save you some time and go through this. Um, these are just some of his works. Uh, the next slide also shows some of his um, works and if you look at these two these are part of the um, series that he's doing so these are two of his older ones that he's going to be doing on uh, some of these walls that we have going on um, this is our tour uh, it's a graffiti heart production again some of you have already seen this um, and it's funded by graffiti heart and the Cuyahoga arts and culture grant funding uh, next slide um, this is just where the tour pieces are going um, and the Midtown Michael Stanley tribute is where we're, what we're actually uh, seeking approval for for today. So if you want to go to the next slide, next slide. Um, it'll be located at 2630 Payne Avenue. Um, this is a new warehouse space, so it's a uh, pretty industrial. Um, these are just some examples of what it's going to look like from the highway. Um, which kind of coincides with the, the text that he's gonna be using from the Michael Stanley song. Um, so if you wanna to go to the next slide, it's just another example of what it'll look like from um, this angle. And then the next slide will show you what it'll look like um, just walking by, so, or what the building looks like. So it'll basically go there in that corner. Um, Michael Stanley, as some of you might know, was very popular in the 70s and 80s. Um, musician, TV host from Cleveland. Um, and this is essentially the mock-up of, of what Wordsmith will be doing on that wall. And next slide. And this is just another mock-up um, for what it'll look like from the highway angle. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to also to note that um, it'll be done with uh, locks on uh, paint by Sherwin-Williams with aerosol using stencils and it'll last for 10 plus years. And I think that should be it. I did that real fast, saving you guys some time this morning. Um, hopefully, if you have any questions, I can answer them, but it's pretty straightforward. Mr. Ch Chair, Mr. Chair, I would just like to make one point of clarification. Uh, the applicant indicated that um, the artist attended Miami University, uh, University of Miami. That is incorrect. It's Miami University. I take umbrage. Umbrage because I'm a Miami University <laughs> grad. Thank you. So sorry. I, I second the umbrage, August. Yes. So, so. <laughs> my sister went there too, so I, I apologize for the for the mix up in, in text there. I approve. And I'll second, but I do have a question. Who owns the building? Um, it's owned by the. Um, it was in the text there. I kind of skipped over it. But it's, um, I'm not sure who owns it. Exactly, there's a, but it's, it's there's the a warehouse furniture building. company. Yeah, so there's a furniture company that yeah. um, currently exists on Superior Avenue, which is moving its headquarters into this particular building. So the owners have approved. Thank you. Thanks. We have Thank a motion you. and second. Further discussion? Call the roll, please. 
Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you so Is there much. Any amendment? Um, it's unnumbered, changing the use area height district of parcels of land bounded by Detroit Avenue, Cuyahoga River, Carnegie Avenue, and West 25th Street, adding urban form overlay. Who's here for this one? Is this Kyle? Are you talking to this one? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, so thank you, uh, thank you, Commission members, for being here. Um, this one uh, is a pretty large uh, rezoning, uh, both in terms of geography and uh, its importance to the future of, uh, of the city. Um, uh, we're going to be looking at a large portion of the flats today. So I just want to give you uh, the kind of the scope of what we're looking at. So um, the description starts uh, on Detroit Avenue, so that the, the Detroit um, uh, Bridge to the north, uh, West 25th Street to the west. Uh, Franklin Avenue, Carter Road, Scranton, and Columbus Road are all kind of uh, in the middle of these, but it's actually these two peninsulas plus um, plus the new park uh, along West 25th Street. Uh, so the proposal is to change the use area and height districts of uh, of the parcels of land just described. Um, this is map change 2622. However, it is not an introduced ordinance yet, so there um, there is no legislation yet. This is uh, this is preliminary. Uh, the purpose is to facilitate the development of the new Irish Town uh, Bend Park. Um, we want to be able to uh, permit residential uses in the flats by right, which today uh, are prohibited in, in the entire section that we're going to be looking at. Uh, we're going to be leveraging uh, public assets and investments to, for new private investment. Uh, we want to ensure compatibility between new non-industrial uh, uses and existing ones. And, uh, and ensure new developments are advancing the city's walkability goals. Next slide. Uh, so this is the proposed map here. Um, what we're looking at on the west, I think we're going to start with the park itself. Um, so the green areas uh, are the new uh, proposed open space recreation districts. Right now, uh, those have a couple of different zoning categories on them. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, so right now, uh, the green area has on it general industry. Uh, oops. Uh, right now, the green area has on it general industry, uh, a limited local retail district, a local retail district, and a multifamily district. So uh, we're proposing to consolidate all of those into a open space recreation district. Uh, for the new Irish Town Bend Park and a piece of the uh, Canal Basin Park. So um, here you're looking at kind of the imagery of uh, of the main body of the park uh, on the west side uh, of the river, uh, off of West 25th Street, south of Detroit, north of Franklin. Um, so right now, all of this is proposed to be the new Irish Town Bend Park. So uh, so putting that into the open space recreation district makes a lot of sense um, as a as a key step towards the, the realization of this park. Uh, next next slide. And we're also going to be grabbing a piece of uh, land that was rezoned as part of um, uh, the West Bank of the Flats rezoning a few years ago. Uh, at that time, uh, we weren't exactly sure how this land was going to be maintained or developed, um, and, it, and it is now proposed to be part of the new Irish Town Bend Park. So um, we had zoned it uh, limited local retail as part of that rezoning. Uh, today, we're, we're going to ask you to change that to open space as, um, as, as we know that the future of this is going to be part of the Irish Town Bend Park and a connection uh, all the way to Heritage Park uh, uh, here on the left. There's also a, a city owned parcel um, on the on the closer to downtown. Um, so this is underneath the, uh, the Detroit bridge and the RTA bridge. Um, it's uh, the new Lake Link trail is going to run uh, just to the right. Well, right through the middle of it. Um, you can see it there uh, on the kind of lower. Right hand side of the, of the 1st image. Um, so this is all uh, city owned uh, uh, land and it's proposed to be part of the uh, canal basin park going forward. So, um, just again, consolidating that into the open space recreation district. Uh, the blue image or the blue uh, area you're seeing here, 
uh, that is what we're proposing to change to a semi-industry district. Right now, everything you're looking at is either general industry or there's a small uh, kind of odd-shaped parcel that is zoned for downtown residential. Um, right now, that parcel is actually a parking lot. Uh, there must have been a, a plan for that at some point uh, way back, but um, it was never realized. So uh, the reason that we're asking for this change from general industry, for the most part, to semi-industry is that the general industry district does not permit residential uses by right or within a certain boundary of the district. So even if you are close to a general industry district, you would have to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals for uh, to request the use of residential even near a general industry district. We know that most of the land down here is changing from a, a general industry um, character to, uh, to mixed use or residential. So it feels like the appropriate moment to, to make that change. This is, uh, I like to call this like the lightest touch that we can give um, to in, order, in order to be able to do residential. So um, if you have an existing general industry use within this district, and I, I don't believe that there are any, we did a, we did a survey um, of most of the properties down here and we don't believe that there are any general industry uses left. Uh, but, if you, but if there are, those can continue in perpetuity uh, even with this change. If they needed to expand or or change to a different general industry use, they would have to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals. But given that the trajectory of this area is to mixed use and residential, it's probably appropriate that they do so. So, so I guess my question is, did, did you give all the property owners notice that you were doing this? Everybody that's in the blue district was served a, a, no, a public notice by mail. Okay. And you didn't receive anyone back saying, I operate an industrial building here. Uh, to my knowledge, the City Planning Commission did not receive any notices or, or letters uh, to that regard. I just want to be covered on that. Yeah. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing that we're doing here, those orange lines, those are the, uh, the urban form overlay. So um, uh, it's not shown on this map, but there is a lot of urban form overlay that's, uh, that's been mapped on the west bank of the flats. And, uh, and if you go, I guess it's uh, south east um, towards Tremont, a lot of the districts uh, down there have also been, um, uh, been given the urban form overlay. So this is just a continuation of our, um, our, our uh, plan to advance the city's walkability goals by adding uh, this overlay district that requires buildings closer to the street with uh, windows and doors facing the street. Um, it limits the, or uh, it doesn't limit, but uh, reduces the required parking. Um, it removes the floor area ratio requirements. Uh, it removes a lot of the setbacks. So it's really intended for uh, places that are supposed to be walkable. And given all the public investments in bike lanes and uh, pedestrian paths and mixed use paths down here, um, we feel it's appropriate to do so. So if we want to go through a couple of the slides will just show you uh, what this area looks like. Um, so this is the Columbus Road Peninsula. I'm sure all the commission members are familiar with uh, with the area, um, but it is it is changing and it's changing rapidly. Uh, there are several proposals um, today that are working their way through uh, kind of design development um, to convert some of these existing buildings into residential, uh, which again would require Board of Zoning Appeals variances. Um, there is uh, a few projects that are looking at new construction, uh, residential and mixed use down here. So um, all of those, uh, all of those projects would uh, spend a lot of time in board zoning appeals. Um, and because uh, the plan for this area is to convert to mixed use and residential, um, we don't want them to have to do that. Uh, next slide. Um, this is Carter Road. Uh, uh, the new bike paths have gone in uh, here. Um, the Thunderbird project, um, you know, is a large uh, undertaking um, that's uh, that's been proposed down here. I have spoken to the developers um, uh, that own Thunderbird uh, several times about this rezoning. Uh, if you remember a few years ago, there was an NRP project that was proposed uh, on a large site that was all residential. Uh, it did not go forward, um, but that would have needed variances. So the developer, uh, and I don't want to speak for them, but they have been supportive of the change to semi-industry. It's going to allow them to do uh, everything that they would have, uh, have been doing anyway um, without the burden of going to Board of Zoning Appeals for that uh, residential use. 
Um, the building uh, on the top there uh, has just been rehabbed um, and, and they're gonna be signing a tenant with that pretty soon. Uh, it's pretty cool, it backs up to the uh, to the river. And so, um, so that's the first kind of big development that's happened down there, but uh, we know changes are coming to the peninsula. Next slide. Uh, and then just Scranton Road too. Um, the the uh, the public has made large investments in in Scranton Road um, with the new uh, mixed use pass. Um, the 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 road has been fully rehabbed. Um, it's built and rebuilt from the ground up with bike lanes um, and sidewalks. Um, so again, we're just trying to leverage all those public investments um, to to spur the private uh, investment that we um, that we know that this area uh, deserves. Next slide. And again, just because we're adding the urban form overlay, kind of already went through uh, most of its um, uh, highlights, but it, but essentially it, it removes a lot of the, the barriers to the, the kind of development that we would like to see um, that advances the city's walkability goals. Next slide. Um, so again, the purpose, uh, again, on the right, um, the, the map on the left, showing you everything we'd like to do and uh, be happy to take any questions. Commission members. I don't know. It's not a question. It's a comment. Um, I think this is great, and you know, I'm a huge fan of really following zoning or redoing zoning and following these plans. Um, the question I actually have is is maybe you can't answer it. Is that um, you know we really haven't officially seen anything from Vision for the Valley. Um, the it's a pretty large track of land down here that's exciting and I agree with you so I commend this proposal and I'm in support of it. But it it leads me to think that that what's really also needed in addition to this is a more granular kind of public development plan or project connectivity plan that shows um, my fear is and, and is one is that there is so much momentum, but we're going to get some large projects that piecemeal that don't really connect together in terms of a kind of what's the potential of this place back down here. And so, for lack of a better word, there needs to be some kind of like civic vision plan for this district and that starts to look at uh, and I think the NRP example was one where, you know, I had some issue with. The potential of it connecting through the site that didn't make sense today, but could have made sense long term if there was a larger vision for the district. So, and I'm not sure who's in charge of that or whether that would come via this vision for the valley. But I, I just want to say I really want to encourage that and and for it to also um, get a little bit more granular for us so that we can be able to review all these projects that are going to come to us and understand how they might relate to each other. And that's what is worrying me because I, I don't know that right now we'll be able to take one project from the next and understand how they'll add up to a bigger vision. So not a criticism, just an encouragement to come back with that because it is really exciting. And I think once Irish Town Bend gets going, it's going to be like exponential in terms of what's going to come at us and we're not going to be ready we're going to be really reactive and I can feel it coming. So that's my comment. I would concur with Lillian. I would concur with Lillian. Um, um, you know, this, this administration has their days are numbered, obviously, but um, whoever comes into office needs to be more strategic and more communicative and more inclusive as it relates to what's going on in city hall and not bifurcate all these efforts and then find ourselves um, what I believe Lydia might be suggesting with with uh, a conundrum or, or contradiction. Thank you. Yeah, and if you remember, Commission members, um, the director has been trying to have a public meeting out in this area. And obviously with COVID, there were people on the commission that weren't ready for that. I think we're getting to that point that hopefully everyone's getting ready for a meeting in this neighborhood and moving forward with uh, a larger vision. So this is a public meeting. I'm going to open it up to proponents first and then hear from opponents. I ask everyone to keep their comments to three minutes or less so we can move on to other items. So proponents, those people in favor of the zoning change, proponents. Hearing none, I'm going to move to opponents. P 
people against the zoning changes, opponents. I'm gonna close the public part of the meeting. Um, commission members? I think Commissioner Slife, Councilman yeah, Slife yeah, has a hand. question. Yeah, I, and uh, thanks, Diane. I, I will move approval, but in doing so, just something I wanna get on uh, staff's radar and our radar, and this is just a personal opinion. Um, and uh, the there was an article a couple months ago that the uh, the, the user of the grain silo at the end of British Street is no longer using the rail. And, and I, from having worked in kind of rail related industrial development in the past, I could envision a point in the not too distant future where the cost of to the Flats Industrial Railroad of maintaining not just this rail line, but also the lift bridge that has to bring, you know, engines and, and, and cars across the river uh, becomes cost prohibitive. And I think as the city, we should be considering what could be done uh, with the future of that railroad line, especially in the Scranton Peninsula. It divides what is otherwise a large development site that could be theoretically removed. It could be a bike path that connects down to Train Avenue. And, and right now, what's really an obstacle might not need to be an obstacle in the future, but that might need to be a conversation that you know we, we have in the back of our mind and engage with that property owner at some point. Uh, just because, again, I, I can't envision a company investing in maintaining that lift bridge when there's not an active user of the line. So with that's, that, that, yeah. that's, yeah, a, that's so a great motion. And I'll yeah, that's a, that's, go ahead. No, I'll second uh, Councilman Slife's motion. Thanks, Diane. Approval. That's a great comment because um, moving forward, trying to work this out with the railroad will take an extended period of time. So, getting a jump start on these things, the Councilman's exactly right. So, uh, we have a motion and a second for their discussion. Uh, just that um, I would recommend, I don't know that we need to wait for a meeting in the flats. Um, my last comment is that I would like maybe David Heath to request, if possible, to the staff and the administration to present to us um, the plan, either for this area or where the vision for the valley is, um, just to see that, that where that is. I, I think we ought to request yeah, no, and, and and I think they have started, but um, I will request that uh, when I talk to the director next and, and, you know, so we can see where they are and then where we need to go. So great comment. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. <clears throat> Luker. Yes. yes. Curry. Yes. Slife. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, lot consolidation, lot splits. This is 4210 Orchard Avenue. Um, this was tabled. Are we ready to take action on this? Can anyone say? Anyone? I move to it, remove um, applicants' requests from the table. We have a motion. Are they here to present? We have a motion and a second. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Slife. Yes. Okay, is the applicant here? Hello? I don't see anyone with that name. In the I motion to three table. <laughs> Second. Sure. Well, here before before we do that, um, is Tom Van over on the call, or someone on the call that can talk to this? Mr. Chairman, this is Matt Moss, the neighborhood planner for the area. I do have information from Mr. Vanover that I could share with the commission if you'd like to hear it. Well, yeah, let's hear that first. And it, it, is this going to enable us to but, to take but action? But we're going to waste time. The applicant's not here. How do yeah. you know he's going to agree to it? So yeah. I don't think we should consider this until the applicant's here to represent this this um, item. In my opinion. Well, but I think it would be. I mean, I'm interested in in, in what Vanover had to say, 
and then we can table it and then go from there. I, I know, but we can't vote on it. Why are we going to waste our time? I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be, um, I'm being blunt. I, I think it's a waste of time right now. Uh, uh, it's up to the commission members, whatever you want to do. I can't motion or second, so we already it's up done to you that. guys. It was a motion, it was a second to table it. Okay, table. I'll call the question. Excuse uh, me, Mr. Chairman, I, could I say something, please? Sure. Uh, I had some communications by email with Mr. Snacky, the property owner, and yeah. he was very distressed about the fact that he really cannot take time off from work every two weeks to come to these meetings. Uh, staff was under the impression that since you're very familiar with what's being proposed by this time, that Matt could be, would be able to bring you up to speed again on some of the issues and then uh, seek a vote at this time. So that that's from Mr. Snacky himself. That is why he is not here. He just cannot take time off from work every but, two weeks to do but, this. But the bigger question that I raised and everybody seems to ignore it, we need a process and a procedure. And I agree with you, um, Michael, but everybody's ignoring that. We need somebody accountable for this process. Well, we haven't heard from Matt yet. And that's why I was interested. But what is he going to tell us? We're going to deal with this issue, but there's not going to be a procedure in place, and we're going to have the same conversation when the next lot. Well, I don't. Comes I don't know. This is actually, hear from Matt. I'm. I'm getting frustrated with this because no one's taking leadership on this. So, so, so Matt, so, are, is part of your conversation giving us the process? I do have information I think that can speak to that. I don't know if it'll satisfy the commission, but I'm happy to share it nonetheless. Okay, I want to hear. So go ahead. So we corresponded with uh, with Commissioner Van Over about what exactly the building code concerns here were, and I think to Commissioner Fluker's point, uh, a lot of the lot splits we see through the Planning Commission are uh, vacant lots, and all the complexities that have come to light with the fact with lots that are being split where there are buildings that are very close together, just given the intricacies of the building code have, have made it clear that uh, we need to take greater care with lot splits that have existing structures on them. The information that uh, that Tom Vanover provided our office was that the property line for the house must be a minimum of 10 feet or the house itself must have a one hour firewall. If the property line is moved 10 feet, so, so the house itself has a property line of 10 feet. Uh, the total distance between structures is 12 foot, six inches. That means that the church would have a two foot, six, in, six inch rear yard from the property line to the house. And then according to the building code, that, that would require a one hour firewall. Without inspecting the building, uh, Mr. Vanover can't certify that the church meets that, but because it is a solid brick wall with no windows, it might qualify. So from a, from a lot size perspective, these lots, I think, are in keeping with the general characteristics of lots found in the same area in the same district, but because they have structures on them, it has these additional concerns. So a lot split of 10 feet with a lot split that would have a 10 foot side yard for the house and a two foot six inch rear yard for the church is possible because the distance between the buildings is 12 foot and six inches, but it's really up to the applicant to determine whether that's an appropriate distance for them to then uh, meet the building code if the building were to be renovated. The applicant did say in his presentation that the desire was to split this parcel so the church could be redeveloped because the cost involved, regardless of the fire rating, just just the cost of, of restoring and and uh, reusing this building from a church to a residential use would be cost prohibitive for him. He wants to split it so we can sell it to uh, an interested party that's approached him in order to do that renovation and do that conversion. So. It's from a from a lot size perspective. These lots, I think, if they were split as the, as uh, the applicant has requested with this configuration, uh, a ten foot side yard and a two foot six inch rear yard, would create lots that are in keeping with the general size of lots in the area. But the building code issues would still need to be sorted out if and when uh, a permit is applied for for occupancy. Okay. Um... Did Tom kind of talk to you at all about kind of going forward with the methodology is going to be for lot splits that have existing buildings on it? Yeah, I think it's become clear that when there are existing structures or, or lot split requests that would create new property lines between structures, that that most likely needs to be paired with some type of 
uh, building permit applications so the, the buildings themselves can be reviewed for compliance with the building code and the fire code. But that hasn't yet, at, at this point, been developed by either of our offices, to my knowledge. Okay, um, so that has to be done, obviously, to August's question. Um, we need to finalize the process. And since Planning Commission gets lassoed with this down the road, I think it has to come from staff. So can you work with Freddie on that so we can have kind of a Gantt chart of how those things are gonna happen? Yeah, absolutely. It's something we're working on right now. Super, I appreciate it. Okay, commission members, you've heard what they had to say, or what Matt had to say. Um, you're either convinced or not convinced. You want to retable and listen, hear from the applicant or not. Right now, we have a motion and second uh, to table. Is that still your desire? Yes, because the, the the lot split that was presented to us did not reflect what Mr. Moss outlined here, which I believe is a prudent approach. So we, 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 what are we, I, how do we approve something that hasn't been um, acknowledged by the applicant or a plan has not, has, has not been developed? Matt, do you want to speak to that? Have they given you a plat that shows that distance? I have not received a plat from the applicant that shows this revised property line. I will defer um, to. I don't know. Maybe I might, but I, I'm kind of tied up for a bit. I'll defer to you, Mr. Chairman, and, and Michael Bozak as to whether the commission can approve a lot split with the condition, or if it's best to have the applicant here in order to verify on record that that's a split that they would. Well, like I to, think. Like yeah, I think August is right. We would need a document that shows that, and that's his intent. Um, and, you know, for uh, necessity, because he's been here so much, I think if it was something that staff worked with, I'd be fine with it, but it's up to the commission members. What do you want to do, commission members? I, I don't think the, the applicant needs to show up. What he needs to do is acknowledge this in writing or in some form for, of um, uh, communication, because if we all agree and he's not here and he doesn't agree for whatever reason, then we're back to square one, guys. Let's just okay. be prudent here. So, so um, we're going to table it, but can we amend the tabling to acknowledge this is what we're asking? So there's a finite, this is what we want if we get this. Yes, I'll, I'll amend, because I'm, 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 I, I, I'm amend the, the motion to reflect that the applicant must acknowledge concurrence with what's, what's recommended by Mr. Moss and that a plat be um, developed so that we can view, view it and, and finally vote on, on what's proposed. I'm happy to communicate that to the applicant after the meeting. Great, thanks. Can, is the seconder uh, okay with that? Did I second? Yeah. But I don't know if I did, but I'm willing to second that. Okay, great. We have a motion and second. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Matt, please have the document so we can put it. And, and if you could send it out in uh, the email when you give us the agenda so people can look at it and let's get this off the docket. That would be great. Mr. Moss, I'd like to thank you for your thorough and thoughtful um, analysis. It was very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and I appreciate uh, your all's attention to detail. This is, I underestimated how important this was, and I think this was important to get right. So thank you. Sure. Thanks. Okay, administrative approvals. Please take a look, and I'll take a motion when someone's ready. Can we run through them just because I I don't have them in front of me? Thanks. Okay. Is, are there more than this? Bro, yeah, bro. There's uh, separate ones. That, there's seven okay. total. Okay. Okay. Should I just give each one about five, ten seconds? Five seconds each. Time.
there, uh, Mr. Chairman. The one regarding the eminent domain for the police headquarters, that was already heard and approved by the Planning Commission as an unnumbered ordinance. I, gotcha. move, I move approval. Second. Motion second, further discussion. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Booker. Yes. Curry. Yes. Slice. Yes. Motion carries. Uh, East Design Review. This is uh, GCRTA Salt Storage Facility. This is at 2240 Wood Hill Road. Who's here for this? Uh, Ken Folk with the RTA. Ken, I'm going to uh, need you to raise your right hand and uh, uh, swear you in. Do you soundly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is for our uh, project 18.71. It's a uh, salt storage facilities. Um, and on the east side, it'd be at Woodhill District at 2240 Woodhill Road. Next slide, please. Um, our requirements are that we need to hold uh, 200 tons of salt um, to service our uh, facilities. Um, one will be loaded, uh, one, uh, one must be located on the east side on RTA owned property. Um, we also have uh, one planned for the west side uh, near our Brook Park shop near the airport just for efficiency. Uh, and we must follow EPA requirements on containment or runoff. And we need to get this constructed by November 1st before the season. Our proposed structure is a 35 by 35 tension fabric structure with a, it's got a, a, a truss frame, a precast foundation, and we have a concrete slab inside and then on the apron, which will be sloped to uh, a catch basin with a particulate bag inside, and then it'll drain to a sand filter uh, for runoff containment. Um, cost is around 140 and it disturbs about 5,000 square feet of area. The next three slides are, one's a 3D view and then the other two are elevation views of the proposed structure. You go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. Uh, we, we, we looked at three areas on the... We looked at three areas on the east side, um, a Hayden facility, our Woodhill facility, and Central Rail facility near East 55th. Um, Hayden was uh, rejected because all the area is used. Um, so we have three possible locations at uh, Woodhill um, that are, are, are meet the EPA requirements of flatten that. Um, go to the next slide. Location one is at the northeast corner. That's our preferred location. Uh, because it's near the delivery entrance, um, it's minimum disturbance to the uh, facility. It's flat. Um, part of it is uh, hidden by the brick wall there. Um, and there are some mature trees there that we think we can save to help uh, conceal it. And we can plant additional, uh, that was one of the uh, um, Planning Commission's uh, initial comments was to plant some trees on the north side for concealment, which we can do. Uh, this was not approved at the May 11th East Design Review meeting because uh, it was they felt it was too close to Woodhill Road, and there is a planned development across the street, uh, which is already funded, and um, and then uh, the, the increased in truck truck traffic was a concern. Go to the next slide. There's a picture of the location. We go to the next slide. Um, the next location we looked at was in, at the northwest corner of Wood Hill, which uh, basically was rejected because we have a lot of underground utilities. There's a catch basin that's near where the trucks would maneuver. And containment uh, just beyond our property, there's a, a steep drop off. So it was a concern, uh, containment was a concern. We go to the next slide. Uh, Looked at the next, uh, the next one was at the northwest corner of Central Bus Maintenance Facility, which is adjacent to Wood Hill. Um, this area was flat, which was good. Uh, we, we would have some maneuverability issues, but uh, 
we we thought we could do some uh, standard operating procedures to to develop how the uh, salt would be delivered. Uh, the structure is at the back of the facility. There's no no utility costs or utility conflicts. Sorry, and um, the uh, we would have to take up a little more concrete and slope it to the catch basins. Uh, prefer to have a sand filter in a, a grassed area, but we we think we can make it compact and uh, keep it in that area. Uh, this was also not approved by the commission on the 25th, and um, same reasons except for being close to the uh, uh, Woodhill Road. Go to the next slide. This is a picture of the location. We go to the next. Uh, these. Uh, this is our central rail m maintenance facility. Uh, there were two possible locations there, um, which we um, both found is not viable. Um, this this one here is right near the I-77 overpass. Um, some concerns here were it's a tight area. Um, we would have to possibly use the access road for loading vehicles and an unloading salt. Um, and there's a, a, a sort of a blind curve there under the underpath to the northwest. We were worried about debris during snow plowing coming from the overpass, maybe damaging the fabric structure. Um, and, and the stability of the structure was of a concern because there's a steep slope right nearby. Um, and, and containment uh, con containment was a concern here. Uh, there's a catch basin and ditch nearby, and we were worried that we couldn't uh, uh, keep it all contained. Next slide. The other location was at the end of Grand Avenue. Um, this this area, it, it, there's an entrance gate to the facility, our central mail maintenance facility. There's a gate to access the rail at this location, and then the access road is is an uphill grade about uphill grade on a sharp curve. Um, so it's just not a safe situation. We had, I, I don't know if trucks could maneuver to get back in there to dump. Um, and we had the same containment concerns. And this one also has um, uh, Cleveland Plants, their new uh, head, police headquarters there. And a detention basin is shown here at the back of this property. Um, and we can't have, uh, you can't have a salt structure per EPA requirements within 300 feet of one of those. So something would have to be modified for that. We can go on to the next slide. Uh, that basically says slides uh, states what I just said. We did look at traffic considerations. Um, Woodhill gets about 10 to 30 deliveries a day. Um, the initial it would take plus or minus 20 loads of uh, salt to fill the structure. Uh, we we considered this would be like a normal improvement project at the site. Um, I recently did a job where we used like five or six concrete trucks that came in to fix some pavement. So it's a short duration and uh, the, the traffic would go away after it's done. Um, we would have though, uh, I mean, you're gonna have periodic deliveries to uh, fill the structure. Um, and, uh, but those would be uh, we thought, felt within the 10 to 30 deliveries is uh, reasonable. Um, there are no known um, truck restrictions on Woodhill. Um, uh, we tried to figure out how many, uh, estimate how many RTA vehicles would be coming to this new location to get salt. We arrived at six, and if you figure six vehicles and um, on a heavy snow event, we said two two times during the day and two times at night, so that's 24 vehicles a day. Um, it, we shouldn't uh, get many deliveries, or you usually don't get many deliveries during a storm event, so we would have a slight in, uh, up, uh, uptick in traffic um, in and out of the facility, but uh, did not think it would be a major impact to the area. Next slide. We did look at the uh, sidewalk impact. Um, we do have an apron style drive apron, which is better than like an intersection style. You know, you're gonna stop. The sidewalks are delineated uh, by uh, the curbs along the street. Um, there are crosswalks at all the um, intersections. 
um, which is their stopping locations. Um, if, if, you know, if I don't know with the development, if there's any added mid block, we'd have to, you'd have to add the striping and the signs for those. But uh, we have no juris, juris, RTA has no jurisdiction to uh, modify the sidewalks or the roadway. We'll go on to the next. Um, some of the, these were the three initial comments. I, I answered the first one earlier, but I'll, I'll answer it again. Um, it was recommended to put trees along the brick wall in front of the facility. Um, we couldn't do that to this contract because of uh, our procurement department. We consider that a cardinal change just because it's outside the scope. Um, the two or three trees on the north side of the facility protect that we could do that under a change order because that's related to the structure. And uh, RTA is working with uh, CMHA to place a mirror on the wall. And thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, commission members. Yes, um, I'm going to be a little feisty on this one because um, just because something's different doesn't mean the default. Can someone mute, please? I hear a lot of static. Thank you. Can someone mute their phone? I hear static, please. It, it's all. It's okay. Just enough. Okay to put these types of uses in black and brown communities, all right? And the applicant's character, characterization of the project's been funded as a gross understatement. $35 million was leveraged in a choice implementation grant last week. It was announced by Blaine Griffin, my council person. That leverages five over a half a billion dollars of investment to help a neighborhood to help a community, to help people who don't have access have opportunity. And it's unacceptable because it's just okay. Let's plant some trees. Let's make it okay. It's not okay. And to me, that's not opportunity, building a salt dome. That's not opportunity. It's the same old conversation. Let's just put it in black and brown communities and affect property values. It's, 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 it's a shame. Thank you for your consideration. Excuse me. Um, this is Kim Scott, the neighborhood planner. May I speak? I'm sorry to. Yeah, go ahead, Kim. I, I had my hand raised, but um, so uh, we are, uh, as was uh, mentioned in the presentation, yes, the initial uh, placement of the salt dome was close to Wood Hill, and that just really out of um, out of character for the direction that um, August mentioned and that the committee is very keenly aware of is taking place right now. So this huge investment um, of the redevelopment of Woodhill uh, Estates, uh, the topography, uh, the fact that you have a grade going down from the east to the west, and as these developments are constructed, the residents will then be able to look down. And thankfully, the wall, the treatment of the wall is being addressed. However, uh, the functionality of having a salt dome so close to the street um, was just not uh, favorable. So, yes, we appreciate the fact that they did take the time to look at other sites. However, uh, the East Region Design Review Committee just strongly opposed and denied this. Um, I do want to also mention that Councilman Griffin sent an email this morning that he is strongly opposed to this uh, facility being situated at this location as well. Um, the bottom line is there needs to be a little bit more dialogue um, and communication. And so, those are those are my comments, um, and perhaps we can consider uh, this project being tabled um, for that communication to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have one more raised hand, Councilman Slick. Uh, thank you, and uh, echoing what uh, you know, Kim and August said. I, I also reached uh, or got outreach from Councilman uh, Griffin this morning. 
And uh, he shared the same concerns and then just also noted that he hadn't really been in communication with RT about this. And, um, you know, he was uh, in speaking with him. He's comfortable with this being uh, disapproved. Okay. Does someone want to make a motion? Yes, I move to disapprove um, the proposal. And I'll second it downing. We have a motion second. Further discussion. Michael, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Curry. Yeah. yeah. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Disapproved. Uh, mixed use building renovation seeking conceptual approval. This is at 3733. East 65th Street. Who's here for this? Um, I'm the architect, Paul Weir. And who I'm else? Here. I'm here too, uh, David Maryland from Slavic Village. Oh, hey, Maryland. Um, yeah. If you could all raise your right hand and then uh, after you say I do, state your name so we know who's saying I do. Uh, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. I do. Agency. I guess that was three of you. So go ahead. <laughs> who's who's kicking this off? Alexandria. Go on, Paul. You can. I think Alexandra's muted or not at her computer. Uh, someone else want to start it then? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm the uh, site architect and uh, be happy to answer anything. I really wasn't prepared to present the uh, PowerPoint. I didn't prepare that portion. Um, I've worked on uh, the construction documents and the rendering. And uh, well, you know, Alexandra, it's really Alexandra is off mute now, so maybe she can begin. Yeah, Alexandra, are you there? Hello, she's unmuted, but it seems like she's having some audio problems. Okay. So let's do this. Uh, is that her? I hear a ding. Now, well, let's go to the next slide and see what you guys got. Maybe. What we, yeah, what we have is a, uh, a mixed use uh, retail on the ground floor, two uh, single bedroom apartments on the ground floor, and then uh, residential above it. Um, we want to bring it back to its original intent um, with a store and a little business below and a place to live above. And uh, the building is in pretty good shape. There is uh, some foundation issues that we've addressed. Uh, we've been in front of uh, Maryland a couple of times with some concerns, and hopefully these uh, last set of plans address those. I'm really, uh, really quite embarrassed that I'm not prepared for a, a formal presentation here. Well, let's see the next slides. How many slides do we have? And just so you guys know, this is just for conceptual. So I think if you go through the, the whole thing, I think we're just looking at getting a conceptual approval for them because there's still a lot of work that still needs to be done on the drawings and on getting some stuff back. Um, for um, structural engineering. I know we talked a little bit about foundations for this building. Um, so I think there's still some work to be done. So I think if you keep going, Paul, I think you can talk a little bit. If you keep clicking through, Maurice, that you should see some drawings in there. Yes, this is, oh, just this is what I've prepared. Here's the uh, site plan. We had a little issue with uh, a shared driveway uh, with an adjacent property owner. We've gotten an assigned access agreement. Uh, to allow both parties to use the driveway. Um, we've addressed some uh, pedestrian access concerns that were expressed during the last planning meeting uh, with some sideway interconnections. 
Uh, it's pretty basic and straightforward. Uh, this would be the ground floor. Here's the, uh, yeah. This is a basement repair area. And then uh, you can see some photos of some of the damage. Uh, there, it's a stone on grade foundation with some settlement uh, of the stones and separation of the stones. The structural members inside are intact. There's no sagging, um, no deformation. There's nothing out of square. All the windows slide. Uh, you know, the things I look for right away um, seem to be pretty intact. Excuse me, Paul. I think yes. I think Alexandra's audio is working now. Okay. Hi. Good morning. Can anyone hear me? Yes. We can now. Oh, I apologize. My um, computer audio is not working. Um, and if I may quickly interject, um, it's a true privilege to pre present in front of this committee. The purpose of our project is to reinvigorate and rejuvenate a historically significant multi-use property in the heart of Slavic Village. Our goal in this work is to be cognizant and respectful of the past while retaining historical elements wherever possible, while at the same time being culturally relevant to today's I know, but I'm in a, so I can't talk. I put myself on video. Yeah, so can I? I this Go ahead. So I wanted to introduce Paul Weir, who has over 40 years of experience working both in Detroit and in Cleveland. Um, the, he, he is our architect and we have been working diligently over the past year to create a project that retains as mu much as possible of the important historical elements while positively impacting the community uh, economically and culturally. Next slide, please. The architectural renderings, the first set, are the original ones presented by our architect. Um, after this set are the updated versions that were requested at the previous meeting. We have discussed and created a peaceful resolution to the shared driveway issue and um, also to the outside fa facade, including the side size of the, the shutters on the window, which I believe Paul could address better. Paul? Yes. Are there any, any, any questions on that? Commission members, and this is for uh, conceptual approval. You have the pictures of the neighborhood, the street, and the adjacent buildings? We do. If we continue on through the slides, they are a little further along in the presentation. Thank you. Alexandra, if you could mute your computer's audio to, we're getting some echo. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd be interested in hearing from uh, the development corporation as well. Hi, all. Um, um, so we're, you know, usually I'm in front of you for demolition. So we're excited to see a building that's being, um, being restored. Thank you. Councilman's life. Um, and this building is significant. Uh, both Councilman Brancatelli and I are excited to see this building being restored. You know, it's been not touched for a long period of time. Um, so we're excited to see them wanting to do some stuff. We feel that we're trying to get them on the right track. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be done still. I'm just hoping they have the funding um, to do what they need to be doing because I know we have brought you uh, brought in a few other developers that looked at this building and were concerned that were developers that have good track record that were concerned about the foundation issues of the building anyhow. But 
That being said, um, it's just trying to keep them on the same track of what needs to be done. So the conceptual is great. Um, we're concerned a little bit about parking and the house behind it, making sure that they get a good parking lot. But overall, we're excited to see that this building could possibly have has potential to be restored. Thanks, Mayor Helena. And it looks like there were a number of uh, during the motion. There's a number of items that they want to address too. So. Any other questions, Commissioner Members? No, I'm willing to move for conceptual approval and uh, second. We have a motion and second. Further discussion? Roll, please, Michael. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. Sorry, August? Yes. Curry. Yes. Slife. Yes. Motion carries. Look forward to seeing you again. Uh, Southeast Design Review proposed demolition of a two story residential structure. Uh, this is located at 2868 East 114th Street. Who's here for this? I'm here, Director Donald, and Valencia White is here as well. Good morning, Commission. Good morning. Um, as you recall, Wu Jun um, previously did these presentations to you. He left us a couple of months ago. So, Valencia, this is her first time. So, um, I have the pleasure of um, kind of training her today. So, thank you for your patience. There should be a presentation, correct? Yes. Just tell us when you want you the want next slide. Okay? Oh, Valencia, you want to go ahead? Can you all hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, great. So um, we're going to present two properties. The first one is this proposed for demolition, the 2868 East 114th Street. Move to the next slide, please. And what we want to do with this one and a half story structure is um, the current owner has had the property for 13 years and it has been condemned for over two years. As you can see, the outstanding property taxes are over $20,000, and it also includes our board up fees. Our site plan is to um, clear the land, grade it, and seed it with grass. The next slide. This is just a site location to give you a perspective of where the property is. The red dot indicates the location of the site. Next slide. More context slide is closer where you can see that there is a um, convenience store just to the north of the property. And then there are some residential structures nearby. Next slide. So these pictures show the right and left view of the property. Next slide. And the top property that address is 2876 East 114th Street. It's just south of the proposed property. And as you can see, it's well maintained. It is occupied. The bottom slide shows the convenience store. I think it's called um, Jeans. And it's located at 11312 Buckeye Road. And that's also up and operating. Next slide. The top photo is another surrounding property. It's across the street and that's located at 2873 East 114th Street. That property is occupied. And the bottom photo it starts to show you the interior of the proposed demolished structure. So if you just um, go back one more slide. So if you just look at that bottom photo, this is the kitchen area and you see that big um, gaping hole in the kitchen area. You could go to the next slide. Next, okay, thank you. The top is the um, bathroom, and then the bottom photo shows the interior stairway where you can see it has a lot of damage from water where the roof was leaking. Next slide, more interior damage. The top shows a wall from the leaking roof damage, and then the bottom is the collapsed flooring in the basement, the collapsed stairs in the basement. 
And our site finish plan is to clear, grade, and seed the lot with grass in accordance with our city specifications. So that's the um, property that we're proposing to have approved for demolition. Thank you. Um, well, this is Lillian, um, and uh, great job for your first presentation. That was excellent. Thank so, you. <laughs> <that was gone. laughs> I'll Pardon me? Lillian, did you move approval? I did. I'll second Downing. Okay, we have a motion to second further discussion. Yes, I would like to second Lillian's uh, comments. Great job. Um, you're natural. Thank you. Appreciate it. Michael, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. Yep. Slight. Yes. yes. Motion carries. So the next one is a proposed demolition of a two and a half story residential structure. And this is located at 10704 Union Avenue. Go ahead. Yes. So this structure is actually in the mayor's transformation initiative um, area. And if you move to the next slide, we're seeking approval for this property. It has, um, the current owner has had owned it for over 30 years. And it is actually a trust that's located out of state who owns this property. It has been condemned and vacant for over three years. And the property taxes are a little over $7,600. So our plan is to clear the land, seed it, and um, seed it so grass can grow. Next slide. This is just the site location with the surrounding areas. The red mark indicates where the uh, property is. And then that's a closer context slide. But on this slide, this is an older slide. So the property to the right is no longer there. And you see that um, in the last slide of this presentation. Next slide. This is um, the garage and the front of the structure. The bottom shows the most recent survey photo, which was taken earlier this year. And the top photo is from a Google shot of the site. Next slide. These are side view and the rear view of the property. And if you look at the top, you can see um, part of the roof is starting to decay. You can see like a um, dip in the roofing. Next slide. These are interior photos of the property. It's um, really, <laughs> I guess the, the nicest way to say it is trashed in the inside. The next slide shows the surrounding properties. So the top photo is a Northeast property and that address is 10801 Union Avenue. It's owned by the New Dimensions Church of Worship and Revelation. The center photo is actually um, in foreclosure, and that address is 10608 Union Avenue. And then the bottom house is directly across the street of the proposed demo, and that address is 10611 Union Avenue, and it is occupied. So the last slide, as you can see, um, both parcels that's associated with this property are vacant, and our um, plan is to seed it, I mean, grade it, seed it, and straw it. Well, grade it and seed it for grass and grow. <laughs> so that's our presentation, and we're open for any questions that you may have, and hopefully you'll approve. I move approval, Downing. Second. Okay, we have a motion second further discussion. I just like to say you've done a really nice job. I like how you show some context around it for us. Um, it really shows a necessity um, showing the outside and the inside showing us that there's really no um, historic way you know, historic ability to rejuvenate it again kind of gives us the, the best idea of why it can't be safe. So thank you for that. So call the roll, please, Michael. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Luker. Yes. 
Curry. Yes. Slife. Yes. Motion carries. Looking forward to seeing you again. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay, the next is Euclid Corridor Design Review. This is Midtown Housing Development, new construction. This is located at 7218 Euclid Avenue. Who's here for this? Uh, John Wagner from City Architecture. Mr. Hey, Chair, I must, I must recuse myself. Okay, thank you, August. Um, John, uh, raise your right hand. You soundly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as I you do. shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, also, uh, we are the next two calendar or next two agenda items. Uh, and actually, the demolition is the second item on the agenda, and it's actually first in the same presentation. If it's okay with you, can I run through both of them at the same you can. time? But we'll take motions separately, but you can run through both of them because okay. they do go with each other. I guess if we don't take down the house, you can't build something. True. Very true. Um, okay. So uh, there we go. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the context map showing uh, the site location, which is located between 71st and 75th uh, between Euclid Avenue and Carnegie. Um, it's highlighted there in red. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is an aerial map that you guys uh, saw the last time we presented. And just a reminder, back in February, uh, we received permission from you guys to demolish the back four warehouse buildings um, and schematic approval for uh, phase one of the development. At that time, uh, we actually pulled asking for demolition, uh, demolition permission of 7218 Euclid um, because there were some interested parties um, in looking to relocate the house. Um, and we wanted to uh, give them the opportunity and as much time as possible, um, which is about four months or so, uh, to see if uh, a viable plan and the appropriate financing could be uh, obtained in order to uh, relocate the house. Um, but at this time, um, you know, we are here to ask for demolition, um, given the fact that uh, no group has been able to uh, put together um, a, a, a viable plan to get the house off the site in, 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 uh, due to the cost of uh, relocating it. Um, the house comes with its own um, concerns and issues, um, not to mention its condition, um, but its siting. Um, it awkwardly sits sort of in the middle of this Euclid Avenue frontage, um, making it difficult for things to happen on either side, uh, along with access um, and accessibility. Um, the house is set back considerably further than all of the rest of the buildings on Euclid, creating that missing tooth, um, which, uh, goes against sort of Midtown's master plan um, that has seen incredible investment over the years and more investment to come, um, creating a thriving neighborhood. Um, and then lastly, the house sits up on an earthen plinth um, and then a raised front porch, um, approximately eight to 10 feet above the sidewalk, um, making it difficult to access from an adaptive reuse standpoint for accessibility um, as well as the standpoint of linking it to any potential new construction. Next slide, please. The house, the exterior and in the interior are in pretty rough shape. Um, it has sat virtually vacant for nearly two decades, um, but for a lone caretaker who I would submit has done a little care and more taking, um, including uh, the infamous lion out front and some uh, uh, very nice stained glass windows that once existed in the house. Um, it does have some good bones. Um, if you go back a slide, uh, the stair, the entry stair, uh, and the fireplace areas, um, have some great materials and we plan to salvage them. And I'll go over, uh, where we plan to reuse those in the development. Uh, we actually intended on using that fireplace, uh, but it has been removed, um, since our last presentation. And when I mean removed, it was stolen. Um, next slide, please. 
but the inside of the house is in tough shape. There are no systems, there's no HVAC, there's no electrical, there's no plumbing. Um, it has been um, gutted uh, and uh, water has infiltrated it over the years. Um, I would like to mention that this is the condition that the developer bought the house in. Um, and, uh, and unlike a lot of instances where you're asking for demolition, uh, they have not neglected the house. Um, it, it, it came this way after two, uh, at least two decades of neglect. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that we wanted to give time to interested parties and in relocating, um, but I would like to commend Signet as well as Midtown um, for taking charge and, and not sitting idly by uh, and trying to come up with other solutions, um, including reaching out to def uh, several different developers and architecture firms, as well as different contractors and house relocation firms. Um, but unfortunately, they've received little to no interest. Um, they also went ahead and identified a potential relocation site um, that is the city bland bank site uh, across the street on 73rd. Um, we have uh, continued to investigate the cost of restoring the house. Um, we have estimates between 2.2 to 2.7 million dollars to restore it to a home. Um, and I think everybody would agree that if we were to restore this to multiple units, that that number would increase just strictly by the number of uh, additional kitchens and bathrooms that would be needed. Um, we've continued to uh, look at the possibility of relocating the home, including moving it across Euclid Avenue over the median. Um, uh, with a, a, a cost, including site work, uh, new foundations of four to five hundred thousand um, dollars. Signet is and was willing to contribute um, financially to relocating the house, albeit not the entire cost. Um, but they were very much interested in saving the home. Um, but at this time, we need to move forward. Um, Midtown also conducted a feasibility study. Um, working with the city of Cleveland uh, planning department uh, to see if it was possible uh, to uh, add extra land to create a viable development. And while that may be feasible, um, the project would need additional funding. And at this time, we don't have an interested developer in that. Um, Midtown is also not supportive of moving a vacant house for it to sit and be a vacant house. Um, but the team recognizes that there is history and that we would like to obviously salvage and reuse some of the materials, which you see um, in smaller pictures on the right, um, as well as document the home. Allow salvage company to come in and save important materials that we aren't reusing. Um, and then also uh, provide uh, photo documentation and a narrative um, in the common space so that uh, the residents who live here can recognize uh, the history of this home on the site. Next slide, please. So the development uh, for the last four months or so, we have been pricing, we've selected a contractor. Um, we have been working diligently to value engineer the project due to the rising prices of construction materials. Um, but I'm happy to say that we have been able to maintain the character and the quality of the design and the materials throughout that process. Um, we've made some difficult decisions, um, but at the end, I think you guys will all agree, or at least I hope you will agree, uh, that the, uh, the development, uh, its design intent and its character and quality remain intact. Um, next slide, please. So this is the refined, uh, Phase one site plan showing the new street and three buildings totaling still 160 units. Uh, we are locating amenity space, uh, common area lounge and fitness centers, as well as leasable retail up on Euclid Avenue, where we think it's appropriate. Um, we are developing a new street, which will be a private street, but we want it to be very much uh, feel like a real street with on street parking for guests. Uh, green space uh, for the residents and for the neighbors, um, as well as provide access to Euclid Avenue and Carnegie um, so that we can head east and west in the city. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, we've developed a, a robust landscaping plan, um, including uh, street trees and uh, plantings in the tree lawn, uh, foundation plantings, as well as uh, a neighborhood park. If you go to the next slide, there's a blow up of the, the plants um, around building one as an example. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see examples of the types of plants, a mix of uh, uh, color and uh, native and adaptive plants that are salt tolerant, um, good color and texture uh, throughout the year. Uh, next slide, please. Because this is a, we want this to feel like a street, we want to put out street furnishings, including receptacles and benches and bike racks uh, to, for the residents uh, to use um, to maintain that feel that this is part of a larger neighborhood. Next slide, please. We worked really uh, carefully and closely with our engineers to come up with a lighting plan. Obviously, the easiest way to do it would be to put uh, parking lot poles uh, all around the site and illuminate the heck out of this place. Um, but we felt it really important to um, use various types of lighting to create that feel of the street and the, the smaller scale of the residential neighborhood. So the we have used the a typical uh, LED, all the fixtures are LED. Uh, low cutoff parking lot fixture at the perimeter and uh, of, the, of the site uh, behind the buildings. Um, but we've used a more decorative pedestrian scaled fixture, uh, similar in style and design to the Euclid corridor fixtures um, along the new street, as well as some decorative fixtures up and around Euclid Avenue and at the main entrances of the building. Next slide, please. Uh, the development still consists of four different unit types, a micro, a studio, a one bedroom and a two bedroom, and these fit together uh, in pods. Uh, like a puzzle next slide, please. So, some typical floor plans of the 1st building, I won't spend a lot of time on these. These are 3 story walk ups. Uh, there are on the ground floor. There are front doors and rear doors so that there is uh, pedestrian access for guests and residents from the street as well as access to the parking lot uh, where they will be parking their cars. The area in the blue is the residential amenity space. Uh, buildings two and three are identical and they're made up of the same building blocks as we move through the development um, in and around the park. Next slide, please. So the next couple slides are images of that residential common area that's right up on Euclid Avenue. You'll see on the right, the reused masonry and fireplace uh, from the house, um, as well as some of the wainscoting. Uh, next slide, please. This lounge, we want to be an extension of the, the residents living uh, living rooms, a uh, place to watch TV, gather, have a cup of coffee. Uh, off in the distance, you see the fitness room as well as sort of the photo or the photos of the uh, historic home on the site. Uh, we've tucked the leasing offices off of Euclid Avenue um, so that we're giving more uh, lively active spaces uh, right up on the street, um, more of a retail use. Um, this is just another view and you can see that reused fireplace um, off in the distance. The exterior of the building largely remains unchanged. Um, we have made some revisions to the end of the buildings to reduce some brick to save some money. Uh, we replaced that with corrugated metal and small amounts of fiber cement siding. Um, but largely the development design remains exactly the same. These are buildings two and three. Um, you'll start to, you start to see that historic warehouse mixed with that modern uh, sort of sideways interpretation of the sawtooth bays. Um, I will point out that we have removed the sawtooth bays from the rear of the building to save money, um, but we have been able to maintain a projection so that they are not flat, uh, you know, sort of lifeless facades. Uh, the materials of the buildings are a mix of corrugated metal and a couple of different profiles, um, a really rusticated, uh, rangy brick reminiscent of old warehouses dark windows, prefabricated canopies up on Euclid Avenue, um, some precast, and then we've introduced um, at the rear of the buildings and small amounts at the ends of the buildings of fiber cement siding. 
Next slide, please. So the, the next couple slides are just some uh, photorealistic renderings of the development. Here you can see the, uh, the development from the air. You can see the street cutting through as if it was uh, you know, the same as East 71st Street. Um, the building, the one is sited up on Euclid Avenue um, you know, in line with the residents of Church Square, which is directly across and will benefit from uh, the new street and a new tree lawn. Next slide, please. Down at the intersection of our new street and Euclid Avenue, you start to see that mix of the warehouse type feel and the modern insertion of those townhome looking units uh, above the retail space. You see the ample glass um, there at the corner for um, what could potentially be a coffee shop or uh, some other small retail uh, amenity for uh, the residents. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an internal view of the development showing uh, the park space and the buildings lining it. Um, you start to see the reuse of the foundation wall um, and we will raise the earth up there to create sort of a seating area and a little bit of grade change in a relatively flat site. Um, because this is not a public street, um, we are able to do a little bit funkier crosswalks. So we've introduced a slight you know, twist on a normal crosswalk, um, which we think is um, you know, sort of adds to the excitement and uh, enriches the, the proposed streetscape. And then the last slide um, is a night view of the development, sort of a, an air, uh, elevational perspective looking down the street and you see the storefront uh, lining Euclid Avenue with that would be the re, uh, lounge and the fitness center and the retail, so very active spaces up on Euclid. And that, I think, is the last slide. I think there are a couple of raised hands, Mr. Chairman. Oh, sorry about that. Kim Scott has her hand raised. Yes, good morning. Thank you. Um, again, I just want to point out what the information that was uh, generated from the design review uh, meeting yesterday. I don't know if you've had a chance to review that um, for the, and this is just regarding the demolition for the demolition. Um, there was a 1st, a 1st motion that was made to approve, but there was no 2nd. So that motion failed. Uh, the second motion was made to disapprove. There was a motion made and it was seconded. Uh, the vote at that point was split. There was four yeses and four noes. So that motion failed. Um, so basically the motion to demo or the, um, the intent, not the intent. The proposal to demolish, there was no action taken by the uh, Euclid corridor uh, committee. Um, there was a very robust and passionate discussion uh, for what could happen with the house. I, I believe that that was the intent from the very beginning of uh, this project was that uh, what was approved was the demolition of the four accessory kind of buildings on the site, but that uh, we would study how the uh, residential structure of the house could be preserved. and. I agree that Signet did a really good job of um, doing due diligence to uh, to look at that. However, there was continued discussion during yesterday's meeting uh, with a desire to study the impact on the design of the project if the house were to remain in the location or whether the house could be integrated into the project design, whether being remaining where it is located now for moving it on the site. Um, so that's basically what happened with the proposed demolition um, at this meeting. Uh, the councilwoman was in attendance at the meeting as well as Carl Brunges and uh, Rich Barga from uh, Midtown. And I know that you know this project represents 
a great opportunity for infilling a, a large site that has been vacant and um, and un, um, inactive for a very long time. So we're really glad to see the investment. However, uh, that was the uh, the feeling of the committee, uh, and and they voted on it, and and there it lies. So uh, the project was. Um, was approved schematically by the planning commission uh, in February. So there you have it. And I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Jeff Epstein also has his hand raised. Good, good morning, uh, Jeff Epstein, executive director of Midtown Cleveland. Uh, just wanted to state our organization's support for uh, this project, um, as well as to indicate that I have spoken with Councilwoman Dolores Gray, who is also supportive of uh, the demolition request and the project and, and indicated her support to me and, and Director Collier uh, in an email yesterday. Um, you know, I, 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 we work very closely with the city uh, and with Signet uh in, in city architecture to try to find a, a solution for for the house here and and you know I, ideally would love to have found a way to to preserve it to move it um but i think we are convinced that that there is no way to uh include it as part of a project on the current site uh and after extensive networking calling touring walking developers through and no one was interested in taking it on. Uh, and as, as John uh, as John commented, um, you know we're, we're not really supportive of just moving it, uh, you know, to another side street next to other homes where it's going to sit vacant and become uh, continue to be a, a, a negative drag on the neighborhood. And our in our community meetings discussing this project, the community was overwhelmingly supportive uh, of the project. Uh, you know, this this site has been blighted. Uh, it, it, for decades, has been sitting on the market for an excess of 10 years, uh, and we're really excited now about the opportunity to uh, to add this project, add this housing to the neighborhood. So, just wanted to express express our support. Hi, this is Ron Calhoun. May I make a comment? Yeah. Unfortunately, yesterday I was on um, was having some technical issues with, uh, with being a part of the committee, and I misunderstood the motion. And I understand that the motion was, uh, and Kim was graciously explained what happened to me yesterday after the meeting. And I just wanted to make a, a note to everyone here that uh, I, I would have changed my vote, knowing what the what the uh, uh, proposal was. Uh, I do support the teardown of the uh, of the building, so I just wanted to make sure that it was duly noted. Thank you. Um, this is uh, Commission Member Curry. Um, just a couple comments on the design. Um, you know, I. I um, I would like to say, first of all, I think it's a really handsome design. The architecture um, is really, really wonderful. And I, I just say I'm really impressed with the work that Signet does and the project they did on Ansel across from the West Campus and the kind of high quality design. So, first, I just want to commend both Signet and City Architecture because I, I, I think it also kind of raises the bar. Um, and I was a little concerned in the first presentation when you guys came before that this would feel like a suburban kind of um, like because there was so much parking. But truthfully, seeing it again and seeing the street um, and the rendering of the street, I think it's actually a breakthrough. And the breakthrough for me that I see today is how important this mid block crossing really or the street is between Euclid and Chester from a planning point of view. And I know it's a private street, love the crosswalks by the way, but for me, I think the idea that the street feels public 
that it's tree lined, that it starts to stitch the neighborhood together from from a kind of pedestrian point of view is really important. And it really makes the case for for the building's presence on Euclid Avenue to, to for this gesture. So first, I just want to commend um, the design team and, and the developer for that. Um, I think also, even though it's a private street, I think the name of the street might be important. So to think about, even though it's a private way, is what the street is named and and what it means. So I don't know if there's any good thought of that. It's not obviously our purview, but. To think to really think a little bit about it. So that it should, even though it's private, it shows up in Google Earth and it starts to become a kind of a piece of the fabric of the neighborhood between Carnegie and, and Euclid. Um, and so, um, so I just say, you know, obviously want to hear from my commission members also, but, um, but I think that the. The presence on Euclid's really important makes the case for why this needs to really be up at Euclid Avenue and and um and and although it's unfortunate I'm supportive of the demolition as well but just wanted to make those comments and then hear from my uh, other members well I'll move approval on the final uh, design I think that's the first resolution I'll second David Bowen or something? Is David on? Is, can we call the roll? Hold on, there, there I go. Now, now you can hear me, can't you? I was talking. Yes. Um, yes. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Yeah, Lillian seconded. Okay, motion and second. Um, further discussion? Call the roll, please. Bowen. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Curry. Yes. Life. Yes. Motion carries. Now the second one is for uh, the demolition. I'll I'll move approval. Downing. I'll second Curry. We have a motion second. Further discussion. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add, if if you're okay, um, Diane, is to add the conditions that they preserve the elements, reuse them, and document. That that piece be part of the motion. Yes, I, I'm sorry. I I did hear that earlier and then uh, failed to include it. Um, yes, that the uh, I'll move approval with including the conditions um, that have been stated. Okay, I'll second that. We have a motion and second with uh, approval with stated amendment. Call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Curry. Yes. Slight. Yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you very much. So let's move forward. Chester 75, new construction seeking final approval. Jen, since you're sworn in, we're not going to swear you in again. Okay, Mr. I, Mr. I, Mr. Chair, I believe. Okay, John, hold on, Mr. Chair, I must recuse myself on this one. Thank you. Okay, thanks, August. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe uh, Chris Shefton from the Pamikos Foundation is also on, so she may want. Okay, to Chris, I'm going to have to swear you in. Are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Do you, Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury? I do, Chris Shefton. Thanks. Go ahead. So, good morning, commission members. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to present in front of you again. Um, we are bringing back um, seeking final approval the Chester 75 project, which is located at the corner of E 75th and Chester Avenue. Um, we have been working diligently, as you all know. Um, over the last year to continue to refine this project, including continuing to move. Um, forward with the project during um, COVID. Um, and so we're fine. We're finally at the place where we would like to move forward and start construction. And so um, you'll see some slight changes in terms of um, some things, but overall, we try very hard to stick to what you originally loved when we first presented this project. And with that, 
Um, thank you so much to City Architecture for their leadership and hard work on this project. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, good good morning again. Um, so I the project itself is is virtually identical to what uh, you had seen in the past. If you you can start to advance some slides. Obviously, Chris mentioned it's at 75th and Chester. Um, the historic area of this, you know, shows uh, larger estates and then finer grain urban development. And then all of a sudden, wham, in 1950, uh, Chester slices through the neighborhood and creates a series of side yards along a major thoroughfare. Um, this project uh, is part of the rebuilding of Chester as people's front doors and access and entrances into uh, the neighborhood. Um, the project is obviously zoned multifamily, um, which is what we're proposing to build. Um, it's a little under an acre site uh, with a, an existing Jehovah's Witness uh, building that will be demolished on the property. The site plan, you keep moving forward. Uh, the site plan virtually remains unchanged, some minor refinements. Um, actually, we worked with the uh, city planning zoning department to add an urban overlay or uh, some sort of overlay uh, to the, uh, the site uh, in order to establish uh, Chester as a front door, um, as well as give us the opportunity to move the building closer uh, to or to the right of way along 75th. Um, uh, because the Board of Zoning Appeals would not be allowed to grant us a front yard setback. Um, Chester or East 75th already has a very large tree lawn, um, a sidewalk, and then still public property before you get to the building. So we think the building is really appropriately sited um, where it is. Next slide, please. Uh, the landscape plan um, remains absolutely unchanged. Uh, Next slide, please. The, the site, uh, the materials uh, we have not changed since we last presented to you. Um, they are still high quality. Um, we've picked out some light fixtures for the parking lot and for the rear of the building, um, as well as some accent lights for uh, illuminated address numbers and stuff like that. Uh, the building's floor plans uh, remained uh, largely untouched. A uh, couple of things to note on the ground floor. Uh, we still do maintain a live work unit along 75th um, and then a couple of townhome units along Chester. We thought those were a really great opportunity to have a two story living uh, where the second floor, your sleeping areas would be elevated above the busy street of Chester um, and then your more uh, living room spaces down on the ground floor um, adjacent to uh, the lobby and the fitness center. Up on the upper floors, uh, we still maintain the roof deck and sky lounge for all of the residents. Um, that does two things. It helps to, um, it gives a place for an outdoor space for the residents to gather, um, but it also steps down the, the four story building to a three story building as it enters into a, a more single family, uh, large scale single family residential neighborhood. Next slide, please. Um, the unit plans uh, are exactly the same. There's a mix of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, live works. The next slide shows the townhome units, uh, which I mentioned are up on Chester Avenue. Um, and then the next slide, please, is the elevations. So the exterior of the elevations or the exterior elevations remain virtually unchanged, other than the fact that when we were at design review, um, we had a large 75, um, which was a placeholder for signage um, that one of the committee members uh, told me looked like battleship signage. Um, so we have since removed that and replaced it with uh, much more of a graphic art piece that will be a heat wrap vinyl um, applied directly to the brick. Um, it will last a very long time, but it will also do no damage uh, to the brick and be able to be removed and replaced um, at a later date, if it should be desired. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in the rear of the building, we have uh, made one material change. We have uh, eliminated a large amount of aluminum composite panel um, due to cost issues and replaced that with a tongue and groove metal panel 
um, that is the same manufacturer as the wood grain metal panel. Uh, next slide, please, shows this slide shows the materials. Uh, you can see the tongue and groove wood um, and then the gray metal panel uh, that would be replacing it on the back. Uh, we still are using uh, high quality aluminum composite panels um, in key areas, including the copper accent um, up at the corner of the building and then, uh, you know, sort of a rich uh, wire cut gray uh, smooth brick. Um, next slide, please. Um, this shows a little bit of detail of that uh, graphic. Uh, uh, for those astute and familiar with the neighborhood, will recognize it as the street grid um, looking north into the Huff neighborhood. Um, in addition, uh, we have added some address numbers uh, to the column at the corner, which will be uh, simply backlit, uh, sort of halo lit aluminum address letters, um, just to keep uh, make sure that everybody can find the place. Um, the next three slides are uh, updated renderings of the buildings sitting at the corner of uh, Chester and 75th. Um, there you can see that heat applied graphic, um, which we think is sort of a funky uh, deconstruction um, of the materials and colors that exist on the building. Uh, next slide, please. You'll see uh, there you see the Sky Lounge and the rooftop terrace, which will have views of, of downtown. Um, and you can get an idea of how it steps into the neighborhood, um, having the higher point up on Chester, which is a much busier uh, thoroughfare, and then stepping down to uh, the large scale uh, single family residential neighborhood. And then, as I said at design review, this is the gratuitous uh, night shot uh, showing lots of activity uh, from the fitness center um, and the lounge and a uh, party going up on the a rooftop terrace, um, you know, sort of as, as people drive by and head towards Euclid Avenue. That is the last image. Thank you very much. Commission members. I move approval, Downing. I'll second. We have a motion second, further discussion. I just want to add, I, I really, really like the design of this as well. And um, the way it's on the corner and, you know, kind of really starting to um, push the, you know, changing narrative along Chester and uh, bring life there. So, uh, so I really, really commend you guys and Famicos and everyone. Um, I, I, I think this project is, you know, you know much more kind of creating life on a street that still hasn't figured out how to do it. So thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Anyone else? Michael, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Curry. Yes. Paul, oh, I'm sorry. Slide. Yes. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. And the last one is uh, downtown flats design review. Uh, this is the electronic uh, messaging board seeking final approval here. Who's here for this? Uh, Bruce Farkas from Signature Sign. Okay, Bruce, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth as you shall answer under the penalty of perjury. I do. Go ahead. So this is a proposal for an electronic uh, message board uh, for the Flats East Bank Entertainment District. Uh, there were two uh, electronic message boards in the original proposal. The other location under the Main Avenue Bridge was approved previously. Uh, essentially, uh, at this location on Front Avenue, the um, Design Review Board, which we had the good fortune to visit our friends there three times, uh, sought a further reduction in the size of this board uh, and uh, making this board double-faced rather than single. So you can see in this view, the uh, original size is superimposed in a shaded view on the uh, behind this new proposal. Uh, this revision incorporates both those recommendations as well as repositioning the sign to the east side of the circle itself rather than the center. 
This allows for greater visibility to those on Old River Road and provides more space between the second side of the sign and the alley cat and new buildings under construction. The dramatic reduction inside also affords better views of new buildings and uh, the sliver of a river view that was a concern to some. Front Avenue is one of two main entry points to the Flats East Bank and could arguably be considered primary owing to the location of the only valet service as well as a major parking lot at the end of front. This may be accentuated in the future with potential construction of a new building in the other main lot. This sign is primarily designed to greet visitors as they arrive on foot or by car and set an exciting tone as people arrive at this entertainment destination. It will generate interest down Front Avenue and serve to beckon visitors to the heart of the district. Please note that uh, having the primary orientation directed toward Old River Road, as some suggested, would not only present an awkward view for arriving guests, but is misguided in that to a great degree, it would address people as they leave rather than enter uh, the district. Uh, it is, in our opinion, vital and proper that the sign present to and welcome guests as they arrive at this main entry point. Uh, I should also note that Flats East Bank uh, will have their landscape team take a look at new plantings that will complement the, the uh, circle and the, and the sign as proposed. All right, thank you. Anthony, did you have something to add? Uh, yes, I just wanted to um, kind of echo what Bruce said at the beginning that the commission did hear the uh, first sign and approved it, the main avenue sign. And then this is the second sign that was tabled at the last design review meeting. Uh, we also did receive notification from Flats Forward, who's been integral in working with the, the um, applicant on this project that Flats Forward is in support of this um, project. So we just wanted to make sure that that was noted. Thank you. August? Yes. Um, this is related, but it's not, but it's very important. And I think Lillian brought this up some time ago. Um, haven't been in, in the flats since COVID, but when I visited there, there's no real place for bicycles to be parked or acknowledgement that people are on bikes. And, and, and I don't know what this signage is saying or not saying, but we cannot lose sight of that. It's, it's critically important in my opinion. Thank you. Thanks, August. Um, I have a question, so I'm confused. So will this block the view the sliver to the water or will it not? So uh Dro, can you keep going forward? There's a site plan. Oh, go back one there. So if the commission recalls um the, here you can see the location of the sign along uh front. Uh, yeah. Two new buildings are being constructed, uh, which were approved, oh man, a year and a half ago from the commission. Right. Um, and so what you have now are basically three small alleyways, one here, one here, and one farther to the northwest, uh, sure. which open up to the river. Um, so this, in my opinion, would not, but you can see the positioning of the sign. Uh, when the buildings are in, they will be basically funneling and blocking the overall view to the to the riverway. Okay. I see now. So you're saying um when those buildings are built, there won't be much view, but between the buildings it will block that view, basically. Well, you know, I Lillian, I I uh I I I think that that's really not totally the case. And and I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, people's positions uh, as they move through this street and, th and around this circle are always changing. The sure. one static view that we have here, of course, is a, is a static view from one perspective. Um, but, it, but as people move around the circle, those views are, are afforded them. Right. I just, I mean, I have to be honest, I, I'm not going to make a big deal about it, but I find it quite ironic that we're trying to be, bring people down to the waterfront um, and we're going to confront them with the first thing instead of the water. In general, from a design point of view, uh, I, I understand. I was actually down there last weekend at Alley Cat 
and I parked in that parking, you know, and there's some construction, so it's hard to see there, but, um, but I did have this sense of, of coming down there that it takes you a little bit to realize you're on the water. So um, I have mixed emotions about it. I get it, but um, kind of where our culture's heading. Um, anyway, uh, but I do think it, it blocks it. It is not going to show up on the other one at circle, is it also? Is that the one that was already put in? Uh, at Main Avenue and 11? Main, Main sure. Avenue is is uh, at the intersection of West 10th, right? And Main, so uh, it's under the Main Avenue bridge, right? But when you come down, will you also see it there as well? It uh, it actually the back of that location uh, is the bridge abutment, right? So directly behind that sign is is the abutment for the Main Avenue bridge, right? Okay. August. Chairman, I forgot to lower my hand. Oh, okay. Um, anyone else? Questions? Can I get a motion? I move approval. Downing. Second, Fluker. We have a motion second. Further discussion? Michael, call the roll, please. Bowen. Yes. Downing. Yes. Fluker. Yes. Curry. No. Sly. Yes. 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 Motion carries. Um, good luck. Thank you. Do we have a director's report? I know we don't have a director right I now. I would like to make a comment. Sure, go ahead, August. And charge the planning commission to do better. Um, it's, it's related to what some of our design review committees look like, especially when they're in very diverse areas around the city. In particular, the HRDS, or whatever the hell that acronym is. There are four white men who who have no empathy or understanding what it means to be someone other than themselves rendering opinions on single family homes. And, and, and it's misguided, they have a kid apart, they have their pattern language and they're inflexible. That, in my opinion, needs to be looked at, all the commissions need to be looked at and it needs to be fixed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, August. Um, so August, I'm sorry. I was I'm, you were kind of cutting in and out on my uh, on my uh, end. Can you kind of repeat that, please? We need to look at the diversity of committees across the board, in particular the HRDS, where there are four white males who are empathetic. They they use their pattern language and their and their limited view of this city based upon very narrow ideas. It needs to be fixed. And, and we need to look at all other committees as well. Thank okay. you. Okay, are there, are there specific issues that have arisen? Or are, is this just like a, a general statement? Well, but, but does it matter? We're, we well, no, it, it doesn't, but I'm asking. We, we, we live in a diverse community and it doesn't reflect their opinions are very limited. It's based on where they live. It's based on Ohio City and Tremont. Need I say more? I'm sorry. I mean, why are we questioning this? Uh, I'm just asking questions. I mean, I'm not. Okay. I'm not you saying. Hey, I'm not saying you're wrong. I was just asking if there were issues that I mean, had popped up. Every day, I could, dude. You want me to have my staff come in here and and share with you every day we live that nightmare. So, I so I guess specific I, I examples, hear what you're... examples, and that's I not just my firm. It's everyone in this community, in, in the development community, the CDC community, it's everywhere. People are just fed up and we have to stop pretending that it's not a problem. August, I hear what you have to say and I understand where you're coming from. I'll have a conversation with the director on that. 